Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt. Joining me, as always, over there in beautiful New York City, my man, Dan Rubenstein. Sir! Sir! How are you? <laughs> Like Iowa State and Baylor tie, I am ready for battle. Yeah? I am ready to drop emotional and spiritual and intellectual fists to make sure we treat week 11 like the Sangria Saturday that it was at times. Sangria, I have to tell you, I actually took a little bit of flack for that, for Sangria Why? Saturday. Well, as you know, as I pointed out on this show... um. Solid mother-in-law listens to the show and pointed out last night while we were out to dinner at a sports bar watching the games, of course, pointed out that on the Wednesday show, I mentioned that the solid wife, Kate, probably likes sangria. And I said probably I hedged because I didn't actually know. I can't remember ever being it's in that It's not your responsibility to know every single thing everybody likes. Exactly. Well, apparently... <laughs> Solid Wife Kate does not, and was a bit taken aback wow, by the really? fact that I would Who think like that sangria? she. I, I don't know. Okay. So, for the record, if you're listening, my <laughs> lovely wife Kate, I am now fully educated in the ways out of on sangria. The Gria. She is out on the Gria, yeah. Oh man. Okay. She likes wine, but out on adding cold fruit chopped up into said wine. Fair. Absolutely. So, week eleven, Sangria Saturday, nonetheless, in the books. Mm -hmm. Um, I, no big surprises. You know, the top 10 went 10 and oh, a couple mm -hmm. games here. Some nuggets that I'm sure we're going to get into as we progress through the week. Um, but what were your big takeaways from what you saw yesterday? It was just that it was that it was a very nice, uh, if it's going to be a clunker when your clunkers sort of week, and that could be applied to a couple different schools that are in contention, Ohio state and Clemson come to mind where they had stretches of not being able to separate and looking a little bit confused at times, but were led by defense and ultimately survive your clunkers and also this is now a Northwestern Appreciation Show. Right, right, right. And, right, right. A, and a Bennett Skoranek. Is that how you pronounce it? Skoranek uh, show with that catch. So those were those were my main takeaways. And um, hopeful that some injuries aren't as debilitating as they, they might seem right now. Yeah. And that's it. All right. Well, on that note, let's get rolling the way we always do mm. on a Sunday. Let's have a listen to those Week 11 Reverbs. Michigan State offense, weird flex, but okay. Hey, this is Jared calling from Naperville, Illinois. Hey, this is Scott from Nashville. Hey, this is Megan from Atlanta. Hi, this is Dan in Minneapolis. Hey, guys, it's Travis from Kentucky. I'm calling from a Chick-fil-A drive-thru. Man, Ohio State, Michigan State is the most disgusting trash game I think I've seen this year. This is awful. Ohio State defense, drunk some of that five out of possible five guys, Pazo T. Which of Ohio State's punts down inside the five is your favorite today? Kansas State and Michigan State have already attempted field goals of over 50 yards in the freezing cold weather. Guys, why? Northwestern! Big 10 West Champs, baby. Woo! We going in, Andy. I just wanted to say congratulations to Northwestern on winning the Big Ten Coastal. When I woke up this morning in Minnesota and it was eight degrees outside, I knew it would be tough for my boilers to beat the Gophers. Michigan beats Rutgers by only five touchdowns. Is Jim Harbaugh on the hot seat? If we could play Bethune Cookman in Illinois every game next year, 12 and 0. Frost warning, baby. I just want to say this is no roller coaster season for my Hawkeyes. They went sky high, and now they're burying themselves so deep, they're almost coming out the other side. Is it just me, or is the Oklahoma kicker's bottom half extremely shapely? Watching this Bedlam game is like a carnival barker just yelling, Three points! Get your points, yeah! Why don't you pour me some of that sweet, sooner, sangria, boomer sooner? Has there ever been more of a dude 
than little Jordan Humphrey. It's just another week, and Will Muschamp still can't win in Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. Sore that you wouldn't get me on the phone and you couldn't make me not alone. Go dogs! Big win over Auburn tonight. The Kentucky Wildcats have forgotten how to play both football and basketball. We're in soccer school now. Shout out to Johan Stedegren and all the lads. Well, we're in November, and just like everybody predicted, Herm Edwards has your Sun Devils bowl eligible. Ty, Dan, help. I'm a despondent Buffs fan, and I need to be talked off a ledge. November took Utah's quarterback and running back, but it forgot that Matt Gay is really good at kicking field goals. Cal USC coming back from the half, and Adam Amin looking resplendent in a very stylish sweater. It's been 14 years since Cal beat USC. I was unable to drink at that time, and now I am so drunk that it took me two hours to call you back because... Go Bears. College football 2018. Can anyone really drive for six wins? As a Mississippi State Bulldog fan, I feel honored that Bama shows so much respect to us that they feel the need to buy off the referees to make sure they can defeat us. As a Klinga fan, that means the world to me. All righty, sir. There you go. Your week 11 reverbs. Spirited as always, I want to give a shout out to two verballers, Gail and James. Mm-hmm. who apparently got married yesterday, Gail emailed us Wow! on the morning of her wedding to say uh, how big of a fan she was and to say that she loves her husband, I guess now husband, James. So congratulations, you two crazy kids. Don't go to sleep upset. No. Have a good honeymoon. Savor it. Love each other. Like each other. It's all good. Congrats- congratulations. On that dramatic note, let's get to... Let's get to Bedlam, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay, so they call it Bedlam. It lived up to the billing. Yes. Of course, of course, there's always a bit of nuance to these games, some texture mm-hmm. that makes it all the more special. In this one, did you catch did you catch the scene with the guy hanging out the back of the Sooner Schooner to hold the flag? That was that was that was athleticism, Ty. That guy That was incredible. That guy must do. 4,000 sit-ups a day Mm -hmm. to have that kind of abdominal strength to hold himself up like a millimeter above the turf as the schooners go in full speed the other direction. The horses are running, and there he is in the back out of loyalty to Oklahoma holding that damn flag up. Good on him. Yeah, that dude hammers his core. Okay, had the shootout. It was back Mm -hmm. and forth the entire game. I'll try to set it up if you didn't have a chance to watch. At one point, it felt like Oklahoma was going to pull away in the second quarter, but naturally, Oklahoma State comes back. They were down 13. They regain the lead in the second half. Then it gets real interesting in the fourth quarter. Here's what happens. The Cowboys are down 41-35 at the start of the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. They engineer a 10-play, 75-yard drive to tie it up at 41-41. And then their kicker, Matt Amendola, Dan, he misses the extra point. Yes, he does. Misses the extra point. It's a bit of foreshadowing. You can see where this is going to go. Oklahoma takes the lead on a Trey Sermon run with about three minutes left in the game. Oklahoma gets the lead 48 to 41. But then Oklahoma State comes back. Corndog Cornelius connects (laughs) with Tylen Wallace on a 24-yard touchdown pass with just over a minute left. Mike Gundy says, we're going for two. Taylor Cornelius has a guy open. He makes a bad throw. They yeah. don't convert. Game over. Lo and behold, that missed extra point does come back to haunt Oklahoma State in the very end. Your final score here, 48 to 47. Dan, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, one, loved watching Kennedy Brooks and Trey Sermon and the way that running game has come together from the line, from the the booth, from the backfields. That has been extraordinary to watch for Oklahoma and has scarily opened up things for Kyler Murray, somebody who really didn't need to have things opened up for him. So really fun to watch that offense and the creativity. That is nothing too new, though, to watch Oklahoma succeed on the ground. I was crazy impressed other than, I think there was a fumble in there, the Chuba Hubbard game. Um, Oklahoma State's, you know, running back situation has been sort of by committee these past few weeks, but without a doubt, my favorite Canadian running back once again in college football and Taylor Cornelius just making huge throw after huge throw. Um, Kylan Wallace. 
I thought, sorry to interrupt. I thought he yeah. looked really good in this game. Yes. No, I, I thought he looked outstanding, especially given his size and the way he can move around at that size and really throwing Tylen Wallace and Tyron Johnson open at times. I mean, this might be the most talented or best receiver duo in the country when they're, you know, when they're getting the ball where they like it. So I thought it, w- it was an incredible watch, uh, unfortunately, for Oklahoma State. They've only really gotten up for their biggest games, and it'd, it'd be cool to imagine what they'd look like playing more consistently on both sides of the ball. But hell of a fun game to watch. Good for Oklahoma for surviving. They now somebody tweeted us that if we were going to say LSU is disqualified from playoff consideration after being shut out, Oklahoma should be after giving up forty-seven. Mm. They gave up fifty-two to the Cowboys <laughs> last year. This is an improving Oklahoma baby. defense. So, yeah, uh, really survive your defensive clunker for Oklahoma and good, good fight from from the pokes. Their offense is damn good, though. Uh, I don't I don't know how they'd fare against a team like an Alabama or a Clemson or even a Notre Dame teams that I think presumably have better defenses than the ones that they have faced this year. But right. This offense is fun as hell to watch. They are so, so good with Kyler Murray, the receiving core. Obviously, you talked about the running game. Uh, Good on them. Big win. Rivalry game. Hope you took the points. I know you didn't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I did not. I really thought Oklahoma would run away with it. Um, On your point, though, Ty, we saw the Rose Bowl. It's not like if Oklahoma plays, say, Notre Dame or Michigan or any of these teams in in a potential playoff spot that you're going to say, well, this is a team built to shut down Oklahoma. No, no. No. You survive Oklahoma's offense. You don't shut them down. That's a very valid point. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's talk about the SEC because we had a couple big games there. Most notably, Alabama against Mississippi State. Dan, Alabama has now won its last two games by a combined 53 to nothing, if my math is accurate. <laughs> Two straight shutouts. At this point, probably fair to wonder whether anyone's going to score on them at all in November. That's where yeah, we're that's at it. with this team. Yeah, you're not wrong. The emergence of this defensive line when having to play more than two quarters, they've looked like what Alabama's defense has <laughs> long looked like. And that's with some injuries. That's with some inconsistent play early on, giving up some chunk plays. But it really did seem far-fetched after, you know, the Arkansas game or the Tennessee game where people are saying, when, when are we going to talk about this Alabama defense? Yeah. Not, uh, not really playing up to snuff. Yeah, and <laughs> about like, that. <laughs> at, at that. Even at that time, Alabama was leading the country in points allowed per drive. So it was just, it was you, there was, Alabama finally gave everything everybody's something to say, well, maybe they're human. Well, you know what, Ty, maybe they're human, but they are also superheroes. Maybe they are also superheroes. This game, very much powered by defense on both sides, really. But Mississippi State only had, I think, 169 yards here. Yep, that's right. Yeah, 169 total yards, one for 13 on third downs. They couldn't get anything going on offense. There was a point in this game, I don't know if you saw it, and maybe it was just me kind of reading too deep into it, but Nick Fitzgerald running for his life on like four straight plays, scrambles for a couple yards, gets pulled down, and he just gets up. And I I feel like in that moment, I connected emotionally with him because I was feeling it, (laughs) and it seemed like he was too. Just like, what, what what am I supposed to do here? How am I supposed to move the ball forward? against this defense just didn't have guys open his line couldn't contain a very aggressive Alabama front and then on the flip side not to give all the credit to Alabama Mississippi State I thought did an okay job on defense as well oh really good job overmatched in spots but did a really good job containing an otherwise potent Alabama attack and we can get into the whole Tua injury angle but that aside Tua played most of this game, and I thought Mississippi State did an admirable job here on defense. Yeah, inside on their defensive line, they got a ton of push against the Alabama offensive line, collapsing pockets pretty consistently. I know Alabama was down, I believe, a guard, uh, so they're a little bit beat up along the offensive line, but one, not allowing a play longer than 25 yards, I want to say. That was that the longer pass to Herb Smith. That is a huge, huge win for this Mississippi State, both pass rush, which has been very good all season, and their secondary, which has been challenging everybody. And 
Alabama wise, yes, Isaiah Bugs and Quinn and Williams were unblockable. Not that this is anything novel, but it should be pointed out because they are extraordinary. And I, I really did think with, I think both Damian Harris and Najee Harris are kind of beat up. Harris Ranch, excuse me. Yeah, that's right. Thank um, you. I thought Josh Jacobs ran really, really well, and he had been sort of that more speed option, and he really looked like the workhorse that they needed against a, a tough defense. So I thought that that was encouraging. But yes, the offensive line struggling against the uh, the Mississippi State defensive front, especially inside, Tua was getting hit. Yeah. And I I know people are pointing to like, oh, they're targeting his knee. Like, they, they seemed clean to me. Um, and there's only so much abuse a quarterback can take. He's not the biggest dude in the world. And again, Alabama shut out Mississippi State. But in terms of confidence about Alabama moving forward, if Tua isn't the most mobile guy because of, you know, knee soreness, knee injuries, whatever, that definitely changes the dynamic of this Alabama offense if they need to keep up with, say, Georgia, I'm not going right. to say Auburn, yep. Georgia or a team, you know, Michigan or Notre Dame or Clemson, whoever they might face in a potential playoff scenario. So I, I think there are lasting effects. But once again, if your defense allows 0.0 points against both Mississippi State and LSU two non aggressive, scary offenses, but zero combined points in eight quarters, that ain't bad. It's a good little cushion tie. Good little cushion. Yeah. If I'm Nick Saban, I don't play two against the Citadel. Whoever they I don't believe. Is. Yeah. Mac Jones looked rough, though. He had a hard time. <laughs> he did. Out there. He had a hard yeah. time. All right. 24 to nothing. Your final score is Alabama continues to truck forward. You mentioned Georgia. You mentioned Auburn separately. The two teams played each other and Georgia won 27 to 10. Second straight week now that DeAndre Swift set a career mark in rushing yardage. His personal best now is 186 yards. He got that against a very good Auburn defense, of course, included in there is a 77-yard touchdown run in the fourth quarter, which essentially put the game on ice. Mm -hmm. All told, another impressive effort collectively for Georgia running the football as they went over 300 rushing yards as a team. Um, You know, the running game was there for Georgia, but otherwise, maybe it was just me, seemed like the offense was a little bit off, a little bit bit out of rhythm. And, you know, maybe it's because they were playing a good defense in Auburn. Sure. But clearly, they're going to have to be clicking when they play Bama in that SEC title game. You can't have 12 penalties in that one. You need to clean it up a little bit. They'll probably get there, but it helps to have that running game, at least that you can fall back on, when it just feels like the rest of things aren't quite as crisp as you might like. Yeah, the killer instinct from Georgia was lacking a bit at times on offense. This is this is nitpicking because yeah, exactly, splitting hairs. When yes, I, I at some point in this game, and this was on the big screen for me, watching DeAndre Swift, a a finally healthy DeAndre Swift, um, against the a very very good Auburn defense, no less. I had that same breath holding as I did for Bryce Love last year, where it's just at any moment he is just going to make a cut and go. And this is breath holding in a good way. I don't have an Auburn rooting interest, um, but it was just it, it that that kind of back is incredibly fun to watch. It was you know Christian McCaffrey, the same team, whoever yeah. you know Percy Harvin. There is getting to be a gravitational element about DeAndre Swift, which is nothing short of extremely fun, and makes me worry about Georgia a little bit less. I am encouraged by what I saw from this defense taking advantage of a still pretty woeful Auburn offense against a, a decent yeah. team. But uh, yeah, you're right. There is there is some sloppiness that needs to be cleaned up. There are some consistency issues. Justin Fields came in, but um, it, it was nice to see Jake Fromm with as much as you can nitpick Georgia. There is something very steadying about Fromm in the backfield. He brings veteran leadership to that offense, even despite the fact that he's, he's a sophomore. He's a, a true, true sophomore. sophomore. Crazy. He looks very, very poised back there. You yes. mentioned Auburn out of sync on offense. That's more of an evergreen tweet for 2018 than it is any kind of statement about this game because it's been their MO all season long. Looks like a 7-5 and five season for Gus Malzahn. Unless they pull a rabbit out of their hat and find a way to win the Iron Bowl. Right. We're trending towards 7-5 and five and uh, curious to see what that means for his long-term prospects at Auburn because he is crazy. a name that comes yeah. up and you know we can get into all that at another point in time. But your final score here, again, 27-10. to 10 in favor of the Bulldogs. Let's move to Saturday night up in Chestnut Hill. 
Yes. This was a big game. Game day was there. Boston College was all kinds of worked into a lather mm. with the Clemson Tigers coming to town. Clemson wins 27 to 7 with the win. Clemson clinches the ACC Atlantic. It's going to be their fourth straight trip to the ACC championship game. Looks like they're going to end up playing Pitt, which we can talk about a little bit later. But of <laughs> note here is that Clemson knocked out Anthony Brown early. They did. The Boston College quarterback, like on the very first drive early. Yeah. He was apparently hospitalized with some kind of internal injury, Ooh. which Steve Adazio did not specify when he gave his talk after the game. Obviously, we hope he's okay, but with Brown leaving, that meant more snaps for EJ Perry, who's a sophomore. He was not a sub above Dan, to say the least. No, he he made a couple of decent throws, but it's to to ask a backup quarterback to come in against this Clemson front and sort of weather that and throw into a really good defense when not having probably the the highest level of, of weaponry to throw to. And I know there are a couple guys who've made some noises here, but... When you have to rely on A.J. Dillon, who did everything he could, he's been beat up against this front. It was, and mind you, Boston College has seven. That was on a special teams play. A very, you know, a great punt return great touchdown. Run. But I, I honestly didn't come away all that impressed with anything Clemson did on offense. Right. Um, I know they made timely plays. They really didn't try to test Boston College too much downfield, which is fine. Trevor Lawrence made a kind of a questionable throw that, you know, throwing into Boston College's best corner, which who is a great, it's Hamp Cheevers, yeah. I think his name is, <laughs> which, hell yeah, what a name. Um, but again, this is when your clunkers, Clemson scores 20 on offense, but they ultimately shut out Boston College. Hard to complain too much. Travis Etienne ran relatively well. I thought credit Boston College's defense for track, for, excuse me, for tackling pretty well in the open field. And, if there the one if there were one play that almost defined this game to me it was there was like a Boston College screen or something on a third or fourth down and a Clemson safety sprinted up to make the play but it wasn't that he was just you know a, a train off the the tracks it was he sprinted up to make the play and then immediately came to a dead stop about 2 yards in front of the Boston College player bracketing him inside and making the play. Right. That's yeah. that's a crazy underrated like the deceleration and fundamentally soundness of a player like that. I think is just it placed Clemson in a clear higher class even though BC at least when they played was a top 20 team. I have two things to add on this game and then we'll move on. The first yeah. is that you know, I I mentioned the injury. I'm not sure it mattered a whole lot who played quarterback for Boston right. College because Clemson's so good on defense. Boston College finished with just 113 total yards here. And you mentioned A.J. Dillon, who, you're right, he tried his best, could only manage 39 yards. Mm -hmm. I think this game looks a lot like, or looked a lot like, excuse me, what we might expect should Clemson end up playing Pitt. The game's going to look a lot like that because Pitt likes to run. That's really all they can do on offense. And I would expect but that. But boy, game. do they. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We'll get to that. I promise. Yeah. The second thing that I would add is that I'm very disappointed you didn't pick up on my sub above Jersey Mike's reference. You know what? You're you're on to something. Continue. Jersey Mike came in with a monster ad buy this college <laughs> football season that no one's talking about because it doesn't really have, you know, the fallout boy uh, jingle behind it. Right. It doesn't have the Dr. Pepper pit bull. Rhythm mm -hmm. playing in the background, but Jersey Mike is very quietly trying to win the national championship this year. Jersey Mike's 100% not a sponsor, but if you're listening, Mike, um, solidverbal at gmail.com. Let us know. We can we can figure something out. You're buying college football content. Know. We have college football content. Anyway, um, I did notice that. I've never had Jersey Mike's in my life, not for any real reason. It's, it wasn't in California when I grew up, and I, okay. don't, I don't think it's around me that much. Is it okay? It's... it's <sighs> Some of the subs are marginally above. Okay. Is how I, would, right. how I would categorize. The Jersey Mike's near me is, it's like eating in a shoe. It is super duper small. Mm. And that takes away from the experience. Okay. But otherwise, it's okay. Uh, and it should be noted, Clemson's defensive line is still unfair and angry mm -hmm. and yep. a joy to watch. Moving on, let's go to Ohio State 26. Ooh. Michigan State six. This game was painful. It was. 
it was painful to watch this game. Neither team looked particularly good here. It was just that Ohio State looked a lot less bad. They do seem off on offense. Dwayne Haskins was thrown behind guys who were wide open. Yeah. The running game was okay. It was okay. Just 3.7 yards per carry between Mike Weber and J.K. Dobbins. And I'd say that the 20-point margin of victory here was mostly due to good defense and special teams by Ohio State, who must have pinned Michigan State inside its own five about five or six times in the second half. How much of this did you watch? And are you at a point now where you're able to talk about it? Yeah, I pretty much watched all of this game. And you you sent out a very good tweet that after Michigan State intentionally oversnapped their punter yep. when backed up to the one or two yard line, you asked if the, the long snapper could play quarterback because it was an accurate oversnap. It was it was high like you wanted it to be. There was good pace to it. Everything you're looking for out of an arm. So can I ask a question about that play, please? If you know you're going to snap it out of the back of the end zone, why do you even put your punter back there? It, you're not. I mean, I listen. We know Mark D'Antonio likes fakes, <laughs> so they faked it. It was it was the ultimate fake punt. <laughs> why put the punter back there? I don't. I couldn't tell you. Um, and ultimately, it didn't make a difference. No. You know, twenty four to six, twenty six to six, and didn't do anything really for Michigan State. Um, I was encouraged for a brief moment when Rocky Lombardi came in, had a long run, led to a scoring opportunity that kicked a field goal. I think right before the half. But it's it's hard to come away from watching this game thinking Ohio State's defense is really good. It's hard to tell against Michigan State's offense, or Ohio State's offense is really bad and confusing because Michigan State's defense is really good. It's legitimately very good. And you mentioned the rushing number. Even though they were held down, I actually thought Mike Weber ran pretty patiently. He looked good. He looked good. Yeah. And generated some some good chunk plays later on as Ohio State ran away with it in the second half a little bit. Shout out to Drew Chrisman, though, because you mentioned pinning them back. It was Drew Chrisman who pinned Michigan State back, the Ohio State punter. And you're also right about Dwayne Haskins, it, it'd be easy and somewhat fair to point to Michigan State doing a good job uh, against the Ohio State offensive line. But there were plays where Haskins had time, and it just felt like it was too cold for him to grip and rip accurately, like he was throwing a boulder. Mm. And I don't know how that will show itself in the coming weeks, but I can't imagine it's going to be super warm in Columbus when they play Michigan. I don't think it's going to be tropical. No. Uh, so no. not not cause for huge concern right now, but going to need to make some of those throws against Michigan. That's sort of an understatement. If Ohio State brings this version of itself to that Michigan game, it's going to be a bloodbath. Wow. That's a big statement. And I love that you made it. I mean, honestly, they got to be better. They have to be. They better. do that. The line, the the Ohio State offensive line right now against Michigan's front of, you know, Uche and um, Winovich and Rashawn Gary, depending on his health, looks like, and this is very strange to say, a clear mismatch. All right. Before we move on and talk rapid fire style about what else went on in college football, let's just go three hours and be legends, Ty. Let's talk a little bit about Robin Hood. Ooh. It's an investing app. It lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission-free. Even if you are a stock market newcomer, you can invest for the very first time with true confidence. Here's the thing. Other brokerages, Dan, they they charge what's called a commission. Indeed. So they might tack on an extra $10. Standard. For every trade. Robinhood doesn't believe in that. They don't do it. They don't charge commissioned fees, which means that you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits. And look, it's it's we're living in the age of technology. They got a clear design, easy to understand charts, market data right at your fingertips. They let you place a trade on a smartphone in just four taps. Plus, you can discover new stocks. You can track your favorite companies with a personalized news feed. Uh, I've used it. They hooked us up. We've been trying it out. I can attest to all of this stuff. It is very Mm -hmm. easy to use. It makes trading and investing fun. It really does. 
They are giving our listeners a free, this is true, free stock. Wow. Like Apple. Done. Like Ford, like Sprint. To help you build your personal portfolio, you can sign up right now if you go to solid, S-O-L-I-D dot Robinhood dot com. That's solid dot Robinhood dot com. They'll give you a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. And here's the thing, Dan, when you invest with a cool place that has your back like Robin Hood, mm-hmm. you get a good night's sleep. That's and we true. would encourage everyone to consider sleeping on Casper. Whoa, Ty, you're such a pro. Casper is a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience. One night at a time, they've got three mattress models, the original Casper, the mm-hmm. Wave, and the Essential. Casper mattresses are perfectly designed to soothe and cradle your natural geometry, Dan. Oh, Not to always mention, does it for me. It's got a breathable design to help you sleep cool and regulate your body temperature all throughout the night, delivered right to you in a small, how did they do that, sized box with free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. The best part of all, though, is that you can be sure of your purchase because they'll let you sleep on it for 100 nights risk-free. It's a sleep-on-it trial. As you know, you spend a third of your life sleeping, so you might as well be comfortable. Dan, we both have Casper mattresses. We both love it. Our Mm -hmm. wives both love the Casper as well. Right now, get in on the fun. $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash verbal. That is casper.com slash verbal. And then at checkout, when they ask you for a code, Enter verbal in there again. Casper.com slash verbal. Use the code verbal. You'll get 50 bucks off your mattress purchase. Terms and conditions do apply. I can tell you this, Ty. Jody with an eye works very hard during the week. I threw on that Boston College Clemson game. Yeah. And she dropped about an 11 spot on that Casper mattress going from like <laughs> 10 to 9. So good times. All right. Let's go to the Big Ten quick. Let's talk about Penn State 22 Wisconsin 10. Alex Hornibrook did not make the trip to State College because of a concussion. That meant the Jack Cohn experiment for the Badgers. He got the start at quarterback. He's a freshman. He was not a sub above either, Dan. Uh, (laughs) Nine of 20, two interceptions. Jonathan Taylor tailback had a nice day. 185 and a touchdown on the ground. But that really was all of Wisconsin's offense here. Yeah, I was going to list out the different elements of Wisconsin's offense, and it was Jonathan Taylor tailback and TBD. <laughs> that's that's everything. I, I, this is a very backwards Alex Hornibrook appreciation game, maybe. Yeah, well, we are an Alex Hornibrook appreciation podcast. That now. is true. We are horny for Hornibrook for only so much longer. But um, let's actually appreciate Miles Sanders, who I thought Ricky Ronnie did a, a relatively improved job of getting him involved. I would against, agree. Yeah, absolutely. This is not, even with Wisconsin's injuries and steps taken aback this year on defense, this is not an untalented, you know, TJ Edwards is still one of the more talented linebackers in the country. So good to see him get loose. Good to see KJ Hamler get involved in the passing game a little bit more. And it wasn't the prettiest game. I, I think it was probably literally freezing out. So that seems to affect things. You know, it's it's football weather time. That's right, Dan. That was a deep but register. Yeah. Trace McSorley, once again, fighting through injuries. I know Tommy Stevens came in a little bit and ran it. I don't even know if he threw the ball. But good win for Penn State against a talented but slightly descending Wisconsin team. And they can still what? They can still go 9-3? and three? That Which, is correct. Win a bowl game, you get to 10 wins. It's not, you know, for having a down year, you know, and everybody calling for for James Franklin to leave and to sort of move on. And what does Penn State do post James Franklin? They finish with Rutgers and Maryland. They're going to win nine games. And that's still, if your down year is this, that's fine. I do want to clarify. Everyone is not calling for him to leave, but there is certainly a lot of frustration out well, there. Well, there's, people are very enthusiastic to say James Franklin can't win the big one. This is James Franklin is a recruiter. Right. What, you know, everything that happened these past couple of years is Joe Moorhead. You know, he, he can't consistently get it done. I, I think James Franklin's a good coach. I would, and, I would urge patience. I would sure. caution people about reacting too quickly. It wasn't all that long ago that Penn state was really down and out. Sure. And now they're at a point where 
10 wins year in and year out feels like it's feels like it's almost an expectation. So to get back to this point as quickly as they have Mm -hmm. is a testament not to Bill O'Brien and not to some of the not just to some of the assistants that they've had, but certainly James Franklin, who has done a marvelous job recruiting and bringing the talent in. So uh, a nice win here, 22 to 10. Uh, Neither team at this point is what we thought preseason, but nonetheless, uh, a good win here for Penn State at home again by 12. Let me move on and talk about Northwestern and Iowa, Dan. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Uh, four- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch a little bit. Yeah, 14 to 10 was your final here. I appreciated your tweet where you screen capped the box score and said, oh, yeah, that's the stuff. Ooh, right there. That's There it is. Northwestern clinches the Big Ten West by mm-hmm. knocking off Iowa. Good game for Isaiah Bowser. 165 on the ground against a good Iowa defense. Made me nod my head to see that. Like, all right, cool. Nice to see that going in a good direction. But in general, I tried not to watch this game. I watched a lot of highlights this morning because it was not a great offensive game to watch. It was a lot of defense, a lot of punting back and forth. Iowa now quickly a four-loss team, which really came at us quickly. Uh, Just three of 13 on third downs here. The highlight of the game for me was the Northwestern strength coach who (laughs) continues, continues to get me fantasy points or no, it was you actually, you got the strength coach. I I took the screw loose. Yeah. The strength coach for Northwestern is up there wearing the short sleeve polo in 26 degree weather Um, an extra medium polo. I might add youth XL 14 to 10 Dan. Ty, will you indulge me real quick? If you watched, if I, mean, I can't imagine anybody beyond Iowa and Northwestern fans, you know, had their their eyes glued to this game until the very end. But um, if you watch this first half, you know what I'm about to do. If you didn't watch the first half, you also probably know what I'm about to do. Because can I walk you through something, Ty? I would I would love for you to walk me through something, Dan. Okay. Whoa! What happens? Hold on. What is that? You know what it is? I know what it is. That's Hold way on. too much energy for Northwestern and Iowa. Hold on. This was Safari playing music when it should have just been. There it is. Punt, punt, downs, punt, 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 punt. <laughs> hey, field goal. <laughs> End of half. It's pretty good, right? That was I'm only playing the it over first the big half? speakers. That was only the first. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, college football is about efficiency. Oh, no. And they God. efficiently, um, at least the second half, gave us a couple touchdowns. Um, I don't know what Iowa is going to do about their offense. And I understand it's, I think it's Brian Ferentz. Speaking who is of Evergreen tweets, good Lord. Yeah. I, here's the thing. Every year, there are different players on this Iowa offense that step up and establish themselves this year. It really has been Noah Fant and TJ Hawkinson and Makai Sargent this pat these past few weeks, I think has been a playmaker, but when are we going to say, listen, <laughs> maybe we go with an outside firm <laughs> to run this offense instead of doing everything internally. Does Eric Prince have a football product that we could look into? <laughs> Iowa should score 30 points a game. They develop quarterbacks. They put NFL linemen. They they develop NFL linemen on offense. They they develop really good defenses more often than not. Ten points at home against Northwestern. Excuse me, Big Ten West champ Northwestern is unacceptable. But on the flip side, Northwestern is America's grower. Right. They, I mean, to put up just an, another atrocious September and then win the West. You know. Find, you know, Isaiah Bowser, and that's their offense right now. That catch was incredible, but they they wrote Isaiah Bowser and good for good for Northwestern. A, a really cool story. I just win win two more games in every September, Northwestern. Come on. Unbelievable. 14 yeah. to 10. 14 to 10. Your final score here. But Indeed. good on Northwestern. They're going to that Big Ten championship game. Quickly elsewhere in the world of the Big Ten, Minnesota 41. Yes. Purdue 10. It was a cold. It was a snowy day in Minnesota. And the Gophers defensively have been a bit of a nightmare. They were averaging yeah. 507 
per game in total yardage going into this one. They held down a good Purdue offense to just 233 as they win at home by 31. By the way, they started the year out really well offensively until that Maryland game, really. But um, I think it was Muhammad Ibrahim who was the the star on the ground for Minnesota. They look really strong. Good for Minnesota for a, a nice bounce back week. Nebraska 54, Illinois 35. You and I are in agreement about Adrian Agreed. Martinez. He is he is yeah. going to be ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's Illinois, but he's been good for the past few weeks. Weeks, excuse me, and was very good against the Illini. I actually really like Illinois' backfield, but that's it. They're an island, and AJ Bush is not a good thrower, but they they have been putting up yards on the ground and good for Nebraska. So Nebraska is not going to go to a bowl. I don't believe. I think they're three and seven, but can finish strong. Absolutely. And then finally, Indiana 34, Maryland 32. Maryland having some trouble here. Peyton Ramsey throwing one of the best passes of the day, by the way. Absolutely. Really has a nice arm. Okay, let's go to the Big 12. Texas 41, Texas Tech 34. Talk about shootouts in the Big 12, Dan. Wow. A lot of points. In week 11 here on Sangria Saturday. Sangria Saturday. Yes. Texas almost gave this away. They did. Sam Ellinger (laughs) threw his fourth and most important touchdown pass in dramatic fashion. Dramatic fashion. 21 seconds left. Throws up a jump ball to Lil Jordan Humphrey, who just goes up and wrestles it away from a defender for a 29-yard touchdown. That was enough to give Texas the victory here. Uh, we should note that British comedy legend Alan Bowman mm-hmm. did not play this week after staying in the hospital for four nights. Ouch. Oh. Recovering again from that partially collapsed lung that he dealt with earlier in the year. This meant that Jet Duffy got the call, did pretty well for Tech. I don't know if Hell it matters at this point who plays quarterback for Tech. Yeah, it took a little time for him to get comfortable. He's been thrown into action and beat out and came back. Um, He has a really nice game against a Texas team that was pretty decimated by injuries in the secondary. Not an excuse, and they did make plays when it counts, but um, did a great job taking advantage, picked on the right guys. He goes for almost 500 yards through the air. Texas had a very comfortable lead. I think they were up 27 to 10 at a certain point. Texas Tech comes storming back, and I feel... The same way about Lil Jordan Humphrey as you feel about your Rowenta iron oh, that you also my, gifted me. I love my for, Rowenta. Yeah. For my wedding, which was, you know, everybody just needs a really good iron. Yeah. Everybody just needs a Lil Jordan Humphrey that is just always going to be there for you to iron out all the wrinkles. That's right. And, and make sure you finish smooth. Lil Jordan Humphrey is spectacular, and that amazing catch and touchdown dive, I, I believe, was at the same corner of the field as the Michael Crabtree catch Yes, 10 right. years prior. So Sam Ellinger continues to be good, no turnovers, and you know they improve. Texas improves a little bit on the ground. Uh, was very cool to see. At least Texas hold on, and God, Lil Jordan's my favorite. Lil Jordan, I love my Rowenta. Not a sponsor, though. No, not a sponsor, but, but they could I, just, be. I know how much you like it. They could be. Yeah, I love my heavy-duty production tie. All right. Um, Texas, by the way, gets Iowa State at home next week, which should be a fun game to preview oh, absolutely. on Wednesday. Essentially a third-place battle in the Big 12. Iowa State won 28-14. to The game was never really in doubt against Baylor. Another great showing for Brock Purdy, who purdied like a Brock star like he's been ever since getting that job. But uh, the notable... Highlight here for me was the fight that broke out in the third quarter. Yeah, early on in the third quarter, I think David Montgomery was pushed way beyond the sideline on a run out of bounds, a late hit to say the least. Um, Tempers flared a little bit there. Tempers flared a couple plays later, which included, I believe, I want to get this right. I believe it was an Iowa State player who threw a punch around a referee to a Baylor player. I need to talk about the punch. That was... No, I, I'm 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 looking right now. I think it was a Baylor player. I need I'm to talk about the, the punch. Please talk. Can you please explain to me the thought process behind throwing a punch at a guy with a helmet? I listen. Once you're once you're seeing red to that extent, that is there. There you're just seeing what you need to see, and that's there's a head somewhere around there. I'm watching. I'm watching. It is. 
Oh, it is Baylor player. And it wasn't really a punch as much was a, an aggressive slap around the ref. You would but either way. GPS <laughs> tracking technology and perhaps lasers mm-hmm. to thread that punch through the open part of the face mask and connect with any flesh of your enemy. Oh, yeah. No, that up. Oh, and I think a ref gets some some shrapnel. OK, there we go. Oh, it was. Yeah, it was 52 for Baylor Roberts. Um, and David Montgomery is, you know, he was ejected from this game. So it's unclear what his status will be against Texas. But Iowa State does a good job football wise. And Brock Purdy, once again, looks talented beyond his years. I agree. West Virginia, 47 TCU, 10. Big day for Will Greer. The takeaway here for me is really just West Virginia puts up a ton on offense, but they've got big games coming up here. The last two weeks of the year are really going to decide the trajectory moving forward for West Virginia. They're at Oklahoma State next week. Then they're home against Oklahoma to close out the year. Um, It's good to see them clicking on offense like this. That's important going into the two biggest games of their season. We'll talk a lot more about them next week for sure. And then on the flip side, wow, TCU, four and six on the year. Yep. They've got Baylor and Oklahoma State left. You could probably find a path for them to get to six wins because Oklahoma State's been (laughs) been a little bit here and there. And Baylor, you know, you never know what you're going to get from the Baylor Bears. With the way that TCU is playing, though, I can't either. It's tough to envision a path to get the six wins at this point for them. So TCU beat Iowa State in week five, I believe. That was their fifth game. Yep. And they scored 17 and held Iowa State down to 14. In retrospect, that's totally fine. Beating Iowa State is good. Since then, they've scored 14 against Texas Tech in a loss, They lost to Oklahoma by 25. They lost to Kansas by one. They scored 14, mind you, in a win over Kansas State. Yeah, scored more than 14 against Kansas State. They lose to West Virginia by 37. You say there's a path. I think that path is being blockaded right now. (laughs) And TCU is has been completely and utterly devastated by injuries on both sides of the ball. Um, even when Sean Robinson was healthy, he was not particularly good. And this defense, especially in the back end, has just it's just it's patchwork at this point. I I mean, I couldn't tell you if there are walk-ons playing significant time in this secondary. Wouldn't surprise me with how they've looked. So it is just a lost season for the frogs. That's all it is. The gap year, as we it is a gap year. affectionately yeah. called it here on the podcast. Yeah, they scored 10 points against West Virginia. Like that's that's sort of the tell, yeah, on the state of this offense. And then finally, for the Governor's Cup, we had Kansas State twenty-one, Kansas seventeen, in the rivalry spot. Hey, close okay. out the week for the Big Twelve. Uh, in the SEC, a couple games here that we couldn't cover at the top, but Tennessee twenty-four, Kentucky seven. The note that I have literally written down on my note sheet here is what the hell was this game? (laughs) What the hell was this game, Dan? I watched a good chunk of this this morning. I woke up early. What Tennessee looks like this season, especially the second half of this season. So lately, they they lost to South Carolina competitively. They put up some points in the second quarter against Alabama. They go to Auburn and win on the road. um, And they comfortably beat Kentucky. I believe it was in Knoxville. what you're seeing out of this Tennessee team is everything you want to see from a coaching staff that has a lot of work to do personnel-wise moving forward. But it's everything you want to see in that they are formulating game plans that are encouraging. They are getting the most out of players on both sides of the ball that they did not necessarily recruit to the systems that they want to run. Uh, I thought Daryl Taylor was an absolute monster for Tennessee, uh, rushing the passer. I think he finished with three or four sacks, and one of them was a strip sack. I thought Jarek Guarantano was put in a, a winning position against a very good Kentucky defense, especially the secondary. He was picking them apart at times. 
I would be very encouraged. I cautiously, but still very encouraged, if that makes sense. I mean, they finish out with Mizzou and Vanderbilt. Both of those are winnable games, given the weaknesses of those teams. They could win those but, games. One but of those moving games, yeah. forward, so Tennessee, I, I believe to be a bowl team after a shaky start, getting killed by West Virginia. Um, I think it was six turnovers against Florida. I, I think things are falling into place for Tennessee to be a good team. I if would agree with that. If you, would have, if you would have told me during our SEC East preview that Tennessee's a yeah. bowl team, I would have called you crazy. I would have. It yeah. just didn't feel like didn't feel like Jeremy Pruitt could get them there, but they've been playing hard each and every game. It seems like there is real growth. They're moving forward. Jared guarantano has been pretty good the last couple of weeks now. Yeah. And um, you know, defensively, they've got studs like Daryl Taylor who had four sacks in this game. Yeah. Against Kentucky. So all due credit to what Pruitt is doing in year one in Knoxville. And then on the flip side, just quickly a word about Kentucky does feel like they're wearing down a little bit here. Yes. Defense was not quite as sharp in this one. Benny Snell held mostly in check, though he had like 80 something yards on the ground. 24 to seven, a nice win for Tennessee over a Kentucky team that's been pretty good this season. Yeah, it, it feels like it might be the bottom falling out a little bit after the Georgia game. Everything was so hyped for Kentucky going into that Georgia game and what what, what could they do competing yeah. for the SEC East and just it's tough. It's tough to to get into November and, and keep that high level of play when you aren't necessarily the deepest or most talented team, especially on offense. Florida 35, South Carolina 31. South Carolina was up 17 points late mm-hmm. in the third quarter seemingly destined to hold up that legendary must champ bull trophy, Dan. They had it. <laughs> it was within reach. But then Felipe Franks had other plans. He had other he plans, did. Dan. He threw for a touchdown at the end of the third quarter to get a little bit closer. He dove across the goal line with four minutes left in the game to give Florida the lead and the win. A heartbreaker here for the Gamecocks. They've now played in five straight games decided by four points or less over that stretch. They've gone three and two. Uh, But what can you say about Florida here to come from behind the way that they did Felipe Franks, you know, an emotional kid playing his heart out out there. He did a good job when it counted. I thought Florida continued to show growth on offense, especially on the ground with Jordan Mm -hmm. Scarlett and Michael P. Ryan. They both go over a hundred and they add to 367 team yards on the ground for the Gators Florida's now in a spot where they're seven and three. They close out with Idaho and Florida State, both of which should translate to wins. A nine and three season going to presumably a pretty good bowl game Mm -hmm. is a hell of a first act for Dan Mullen. Yeah, their schedule is pretty ideal for a first year coach trying to alter some some previous offensive woes. I thought Felipe Franks was good both through the air and on the ground. The throw to Kadarius Tony, throw and catch were great. Um, I appreciated the patience from Florida. You mentioned Scarlett and P. Ryan growing, but it was the patience to trust them as they were succeeding with the offensive line on the ground to come back in this game to weather some some pretty porous defense early on and to win this game. By the way, South Carolina their past, I don't even know how many games. So since the Missouri game in the, I think that was like gross weather, South Carolina wins that by two, loses to AM by three, beats Tennessee by three, beats Ole Miss by four, loses to Florida by four. Yeah. So if you're looking for random entertainment, mm-hmm. find Will Muschamp in South Carolina because they are a wire team right now. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. Moving on, LSU 24, Arkansas 17. I I don't think the final score here is indicative of this game. Even though Arkansas did come back, they tried to come back at the very end with two touchdown passes from Ty Story. LSU was actually up 24 to three in the fourth quarter before that charge. Uh, Also a really tough beat here. If you had LSU minus 13, I don't know if you saw this at the end of the game. Yeah, they, they took Nick Brosette took two knees. He took, Essentially two knees falling intentionally short of the goal line with LSU up seven to keep that clock running um, and only win by seven, which didn't cover that point spread. 
Even though, yes, even though it should have been 31-17, technically, I thought there, there was a good amount of ugliness to this game, as there often is with LSU and Arkansas, that it, it was nothing that LSU fans should come away saying, oh, we're comfortably better than Arkansas based on last night's performance. I thought LSU had a number of issues on offense, and there is sort of that lack of killer instinct that comes with inconsistent quarterback play. I know he actually completed a bunch, but wasn't a huge fan of, you know, aside from there was one big Justin Jefferson play, what they look like, you know, moving the ball against is a pretty bad Arkansas defense. So listen, when you're clunkers, LSU did it. It's fine. In my mind, they're still disqualified from any playoff talk. So we can just move forward. And finally, in the SEC, we had a and 35, Ole Miss 24, big game. Mm-hmm. For Travion Williams, 228 and a touchdown on the ground. Uh, still too many mistakes for Kellen Mond, but a win nonetheless for Texas A&M. And finally, to close out the SEC, we had Mizzou 33 and Vandy 28. Anything to add? Um, yeah, any conversation about the best running backs in the country have to, must include Travion Williams. Um, Kellen Mond is probably this year's, like, I, f- I forget the exact line in Dumb and Dumber, which is just a, a huge error by me. But like the right when I think you haven't done, you couldn't be any worse. You go and completely redeem totally yourself. Totally redeem yourself. That is that is the Kellen Mond experience. So okay. yes, good for Mizzou for coming back in this game. They needed all you know, however many thousands, hundreds of thousands of seconds to make it work against Vandy, but they make it work against uh, against the doors. Vandy just is having problems finishing. Let's move over to the Pac-12, Dan. Let's very quickly, please. Very quick. Here is where we stand from the 30,000-foot view Mm -hmm. on the Pac-12. ASU now controls its own destiny in the Pac-12 South. Utah's lurking. If ASU should stumble at Oregon or at Arizona, Utah would be there. But right now, ASU in in control, excuse me. And it also looks like in the North, the Apple Cup is likely going to decide who moves on to the Pac-12 championship game. The rest of the pack, though, Dan, whoosh, we're talking seven teams that are five and five or six and four at this point. We are indeed. And I like it. I like the just insanity <laughs> and how stupid everything looks in the Pac-12 right now because it's very clear that there are no actual stakes uh, involved in the Pac-12 beyond Washington State, who, by the way, that is probably the story of yesterday. That felt very trappy. The defense made a huge statement in uh, in the Cougs taking down Colorado, a team still without LaVisca Chenault, but really great job by the Cougs. Um, Arizona State looks very good. Eno Benjamin, I think, is for real. The running back who has emerged for the Sun Devils against a UCLA team that that plays with a lot of fight. We're in this game the whole time. Uh, I thought Wilton Spate did a, a pretty good job for the Bruins, and that's listen, that's a shorthanded UCLA team. Um, so uh, encouraged by Arizona State holding on and winning that game. Nikhil Harry, we know, is a dude amongst dudes as well. Um, as for Utah, Utah beat a below average Oregon team with their backup quarterback and backup running back. And if you watched any of this game, you should come away extremely encouraged that, listen, Utah has issues, (laughs) but they don't have Oregon issues. That's right. And uh, I thought the Utes did a good job putting the uh, the backup quarterback, Jason Shelley, in a position to make plays. They made plays on the ground. Um, they weathered a, a, a pretty significant charge from Oregon in the third quarter when their offense finally appeared to enjoy getting first downs or desire first downs. Oregon is basically a five and seven, six and six team that because of their schedule will finish with a better record. But the Oregon offense remains broken. The Oregon defense remains just bad. And it's a shame given Justin Herbert's talent and and ability to, uh, to make huge NFL type throws. Oregon just doesn't want layups. Oregon refuses to take layups. And when they do, it works. And they're dealing with a lot of injuries on offense at this point after this game. But it's clear that, this offense is just it, it it was it was constructed poorly. And I I can't imagine that this offense is gonna look like this both on the sideline with the coaching staff and on the field next September. Okay. I do want to stop you for a moment though, because okay. as you know, we have been on the receiving end of a lot of free range Colorado hate this season. That's true. And you did make a mistake, a very rare mistake. Oh, no. I mean, no, come on. I, I make a lot. This team was not without LaVisca Chenault. Oh, Excuse he did play? Me. 10 catches, 
102 yards, no touchdowns. Oh, you're, you're totally right. Very much a part of this offense as uh, Washington State did win 31-7 to in this ball game. Interesting factoid here from Nick, who has largely been in the background yeah. this season, but he runs Love our Nick. solid verbal research department. Been very helpful this season. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Washington State's 131 rushing yards were the most they've had in over a year. This is not a team predicated on the running game. Right. But 131 yards, the most they've had in 15 games. Got to go all the way back to last October if you want to find the last time they had that much. I would like to apologize to LaVisca and all of the Chenaults. Um, nonetheless, Colorado has now started the season 5-0 and and since 0-5. I don't know if you mentioned that USC lost 15 to 14. I did not. And we are about to probably collectively as a college football universe have some USC conversations Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. getting out to a 14 point lead and then doing nothing is nothing new to USC this season. We saw the Texas game. It wasn't as dramatic because Cal's offense, excuse me, is pretty atrocious. It's very Cal gets a, Cal gets a safety on a botch snap um, in the third quarter. I think I think USC shut out Cal in the first half, and USC just unable to build on anything they did in the second quarter. Chase Garbers was fine for Cal, their their quarterback this week at least, um, but didn't do it. I mean, he didn't throw for 100 yards in this game. Cal just wins this game with uh, they had a timely interception on a very bad JT Daniels pick, and you credit to you, Ty. You were high on this Cal team going into the season. Dude, I went like 80% on the whole week on all the games that we picked. I feel this like was, I did this really well week. this week. No, I did, no, I'm, I did I'm just well talking. this week. I did well last week. Riding a little bit of a heater here. But yeah, you're right. Um, and, I mean, you called this. You call being high on Cal in July, even with this atrocious offense, um, this defense. And, and we talked about it. Cal doesn't make unforced errors. There's a talent gap between Cal and most of this conference, but they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot. We'll see what happens next week for USC. They play UCLA. If they don't beat UCLA, I'm curious to see where the conversation goes. I know so where we the conversation is going to go, but I'm curious to see how that transpires. Yeah, they're on. The, I mean, it's on the road, quote unquote. They're, they play that game in the Rose Bowl and they finish hosting Notre Dame. USC is a mess, and it's a mess within the context of there are blue chips everywhere on this too deep. I get that they're starting a true freshman quarterback, but they can't. 14 points against Cal at home? No. All right. This isn't this isn't okay. Fair enough. Very quickly, let me run through the scores in the Pac-12, then we'll move on. 15-14 caliber USC. Mm-hmm. ASU beats UCLA 31 to 28. UCLA played. Um, I, I thought they they held their own in that game. We had yeah, for sure. Wazoo thirty one to seven over Colorado, Utah thirty two, Oregon twenty five, and Stanford forty eight, Oregon State seventeen. Yeah, nice day from Stanford against an atrocious defense, but you know Oregon State's the cure for the common offense. And finally, let's close out with the ACC. Let's talk very quickly about Notre Dame forty two, FSU thirteen. Dan, on top of the fact. <laughs> that Notre Dame's starting quarterback, Ian Book, was out with injury. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame came out with those Oregon green jerseys on. They did. And I got to admit, just to peel back the curtain a little bit, <laughs> this set off a flurry of text messages with Mama H, mm-hmm. with my brother-in-law, who's also an avid Who Notre hates Dame the fan. green the most in your universe? It's me. It's got to be me. Okay. No one else has the emotional connection with the green the way I do. But I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, okay, backup quarterback, Oregon green jerseys. It was not Notre Dame green. That was very, very green. Neon green, if you will. They've worn those before, I feel like. Maybe, I don't know. I blacked out. Yeah, I think they have. Night game in Notre Dame Stadium against a team that in the past has given them fits. Now, it would have to have been a hell of a fit given the state of this FSU team. But I'm thinking, why don't you just go in a dark room and start chanting Bloody Mary? (laughs) <laughs> Why not just really tempt fate at this point? But nonetheless, within the first 75 seconds of this football game, Notre Dame had both an interception and a touchdown. Nothing supernatural went on throughout the course of this football game. Notre Dame jumps out to a quick 17 to nothing lead at the end of the first quarter. 
They're up 32 to six at halftime. Obviously, they end up winning this one going away. Nice night for Dexter Williams, who had over 200 yards on the ground, had some acrobatic catches by the Notre Dame receiving core. Some nice passes, I'll say, from Brandon Wimbush, but sure. ultimately had his customary 12 of 25 passing with a couple touchdowns and a couple interceptions. Good enough against this Florida State team, which has really struggled all season long. I thought it had a, a couple quirks in there where they made Notre Dame think about it, but by and large, just really not ready for primetime right now. And it's uh, a bit shocking, honestly, how quickly it seems Florida State has regressed. I know Willie Taggart's trying to build this team in his own image, but they got a lot of holes to plug between now and the start of next season. Yeah, the offensive line is particularly bad, and that was yeah. that's not a surprise given the injuries and talent level on hand. Um, Florida State couldn't even keep it close against a Brandon Wimbush team. Mm. Brandon Wimbush, Notre Dame team. If that's some, if if it weren't for Louisville, Florida State is sort of the borderline Washington Generals of the ACC <laughs> um, and ACC related ooh, teams like Notre one, Dame. Is. That's a whew, okay. That's I a mean, hot take. come on, we have we have somebody reading during the Clemson Florida State blowout for more entertainment, more visceral, aggressive entertainment. Okay. Listen, Jillian Flynn weaves a weaves a, a mighty good tale, but um, yeah, this game was Dexter Williams. This game was the defense. This game was Notre Dame doing what really good teams do. Take advantage of the other team's mistakes. Stick with your own game plan. Go with what's working and then keep going with what's working. And that was Dexter Williams. And I, I look forward to watching this Notre Dame team eventually against some high level competition so we can we can truly gauge where they're okay. at. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. No. Absolutely. I don't know when that'll be. That might be early January. <laughs> it might be early January. Wake yeah. Forest 27. NC State 23. They played this one on Thursday. Wake was a 17 and a half point dog and they win a good win for them or a bad loss for NC State. It may be an and or scenario here. So we talked about how that running game has really been an issue for NC State all year. Mm -hmm. It should not have been an issue against a really bad wake run defense, mm -mm. but it was and NC State had plenty of chances in this one. They were up 10 in the fourth quarter. They had a bunch of chances in the red zone, but they had to settle for field goals. So it was there for NC State. They just couldn't convert. Wake, by the way, was starting Jamie Newman at quarterback. He had a great game, but it was his very first start. All told, 27 to 23 year final. Wake with a pretty sizable upset just in terms of the point spread here. Yeah, live your life like you never want to look like NC State in the red zone. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, good for Wake. And, you know, it's a sign of a good quarterback coach. Like, uh, you know, Wake obviously has in Dave Clawson and the, the Coffins that they're essentially third string quarterback, Jamie Newman, who, by the way, sounds like the name of a 90s high school prom queen. Like Definitely. a bunch of nerds gathering up like, you're going to prom with Jamie Newman? Um Jamie Newman was good against NC State yeah, and really pretty good, good NC State defense. So, yeah, really, really nice win for Wake Thursday night. Pitt 52, Virginia Tech 22. Listen to this. Pitt <laughs> 400. Ty, play, play the murder sound. Just play it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Where is it? Guess who just got murdered? 492 <laughs> yards and six touchdowns on the ground. Quadri Allison, 235 and three touchdowns with a 97-yard touchdown run. Darren Hall, 186 yards on the ground and a 73-yard touchdown run. I believe, if my math is accurate, that the Panthers can clinch the ACC Postal by winning one of their last two games against Wake and Miami. Mm -hmm. I think the odds are very favorable that that's going to end up happening. But let's talk a little bit about that Pitt rushing attack, Dan, huh? You texted me when I said, wait, Pitt just demolished Virginia Tech because I, I only watched a little bit of that game this morning. Uh, we're recording this Sunday morning. Um Kadri Allison runs angry and oh violently. And you mentioned uh, Darren Hall's 186 yards, seven carries. 
<laughs> seven carries got him to a buck 86. And I would love, you know, I would not use time travel for anything responsible. I would love to go back and fly into one of our dreams in like early September and say, all right, so this Virginia Tech team that just murdered Florida State. So this Virginia Tech team is going to play Pitt later on this season. This Pitt team is going to lose to a terrible North Carolina team. This is an inception team. kind of thing going on I know. Here. Yeah. We're going multiple levels. Pitt's going to lose to a terrible North Carolina team. And you'd be like, all right, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you, future Dan or Ty. And then they're just going to completely and thoroughly squash and flatten Virginia Tech. Who Have a good night. Who in college football media would you enlist to be part of that inception crew? So a crew that will fly it, somebody appear in the dream that's it looks very lucid. Right. Like we got to get somebody or something. Do you want calmness or do you want just something aggressive? I just want people who can help us plan. Such. I think Andy Staples would provide for a, a fun uh, inception type situation in just appearing in people's dreams. OK. OK. I feel like yeah, Jerry um, Palm could Pitt. probably help us pull off that kind <laughs> oh, of. God. Oh, so you want somebody to actually like be the programmer in the van? That's right. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. I, I, I'd probably want Bill Connolly. All right. Well, let's talk about Syracuse 54, Louisville 23. Oh, God. Why? Um, Why are we? Let's just talk Mo Neal and move on. I don't mean to rub salt in the wound here. Okay. And I don't want to spend too much time on Louisville, but they are continually finding a way to look worse every week. How they're doing it is beyond me. They had 17 penalties in this game for 125 yards. I believe that number includes 8 to 10 offside penalties in the first half. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's even possible. The defense as a whole actually wasn't terrible in spots for Brian Van Gorder. And I'm really bending myself (laughs) into a pretzel trying to say that. But has not been a good year for Louisville. Syracuse wins this one going away. They've got a big one on deck in Yankee Stadium against Notre Dame. If you were to tell me that five weeks ago, Louisville players were secretly making money by putting up those flyers in dorm room community rooms and, you know, the little tear off at the bottom of the flyer tie where it's just like start at defensive tackle for Louisville. (laughs) You you rip off a little bit of a thing and you you pay somebody $100 to get their uniform. I would assume, oh, okay, this is what fully makes sense. Mm. This is ugly. And good for Syracuse. Are you scared of Syracuse at all? Of course. As a Notre Dame fan? you kidding me? I've been scared of all 10 of Notre Dame's opponents so far. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. I I don't think you should be, but okay. Duke 42, UNC 35. Wild one here. Big game for Daniel Jones. Yes. 547 in total yardage for him. The highlight for me, though, was David Cutcliffe dancing to a little James Brown in the locker room after this game. I, I tweeted out, he's America's Funkel. Yeah. He's got moves. The, uh, he's got moves. Listen, I am I am totally good with it. Duke football, it's been a roller coaster season, but that roller coaster season means what they're seven and three right now. That's right. That's fine. Daniel Jones was all over the place. He was their offense. Cool to see. It gets real soon because they get they go to Clemson, but they finish with Wake. So they can go eight and four. Eight and four at Duke is fine. It's great. Georgia Tech 27, Miami 21. Tech controls the clock. They force yes. three turnovers. They run it against a good Miami rush defense. Then they slowly pull away in the second half. Miami on the precipice of missing a bowl. They need to beat Virginia Tech or Pitt to get their sixth win here and move on to a bowl game. Again, 27 to 21, your final. Miami scored a second half touchdown, though. So they did. that's new. Finally, Virginia 45, Liberty 24. The only other game here that I did want to throw out is that Boise knocked off uh, your boy Jeff Tedford and Fresno <laughs> boy. 24 to 17. This game earlier I, in the I, week. I watched that game Saturday morning and came away very impressed with Boise State's resolve, especially with Madison Avenue paving the way. I think Brett Rippon set some sort of huge Mountain West passing record early on in this game. But yeah, Fresno State jumped out to a comfortable lead and Boise State 
claws back and this opens up the Mountain West a little bit. There were some other results that I think, I mean, Nevada is a very quiet grower right now. They start off the season really slow, but uh, Jay Norvell and I think it's Ty Ganji is their quarterback. They've been just laying it on teams. Um, Utah State, I mean, it's San Jose State, San Jose State, but Jordan Love is, we might need to start talking about Jordan Love yeah, just in terms right. of him being a sort of Mackenzie Milton-ish group of five quarterback. Uh, Troy did a nice job against Georgia Southern, who's now dropped a couple, but that was one of the one of the bigger games of the week um, in Conference USA. Um, who else do we have here that, that I, I had other notes. Colgate gave up a touchdown, by the way, which, mm. what the hell, Raiders? Um, UCF holds on to beat a Navy team that makes it a game later on in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, I had some other notes here, Ty. I swear I did. Memphis holds on, uh, puts almost 50 on Tulsa. Who's not good. By the way, Ty, SMU is five and five, four and two in the American. It's forget that it's UConn. SMU is better than they should be at this point. Another team that I think I can safely say that for Cincinnati. Yeah. Cincinnati is full on good. Um, Houston valiant effort. D.R. King tries to do everything um, and almost does, but they lose to the the Temple Owls. Who, by the way, offensive juggernaut <laughs> out of nowhere. Owls. After, Owls. Um, the American is is quite fun right now, so I enjoy that very much. Um, and it, by the way, the Cincinnati reference was the fact that they're nine and one and beat South Florida by double digits. Um, I don't know. Gosh, Ty, I don't want to leave anything out. Oh, the, the collision course is still very much set between NIU and Buffalo. Yep. Um, Buffalo wins Tuesday night very comfortably against Kent State. NIU wins comfortably against the Toledo team. Kind of a gap year for the Rockets right now. Um, I don't think there was too much of a surprise. By the way, I said Troy and Georgia Southern in Conference USA. Probably three people noticed that I was totally wrong about their conferences. That's the, that's the Sun Belt matchup, Sun by Belt, the way. Come on. It is a Sun Belt matchup. Um, I'm a dumb person sometimes. App State keeps it rolling with a comfortable win. Um, Lafayette actually made a dent in Army for a little bit. For a little bit. Ty, it was just a little bit, but that's that's good enough. Um, North, North Texas, who had started the year out really well, has come back to earth a little bit. They lose to ODU. Nice win for Florida Atlantic because they won a game. It was Western Kentucky. That's your boy, Mike Sanford, having a tough, tough year with the Hilltoppers. They fall to 0-6 in conference. Um, and very quietly, once again, and it shouldn't be quiet, UAB, now undefeated in Conference USA, 9-1 and overall. They get by Southern Miss, who's not terrible. And Spencer Brown, another nice game for the Blazers. So right. cool to see from Conference USA, now two years removed from not existing, Ty, from not existing. That's there everything I have. Yeah. I quote to you from an email we received early this morning from Nick of the Solid Verbal Research Department. Yes. He says, I'm looking forward to week 12. For what it's worth, a potential <laughs> name idea. Uh-oh. With division races winding down. And bowl eligibility on the docket. Many teams are about to add games to their schedules. For this reason, perhaps save the date Saturday might fit. Oh, I am. We could definitely do a, a marital themed week 12 show for sure. This is sort of a marital themed show. You gave the advice at the top. Congratulations to Gail and James. That's true. Save the date Saturday coming up in week 12. I think we, I think we call it now. Oh. I like that. I, that's a hard one to beat. Ty, will you will you honor help me honor some dudes real quick? Please, 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 Daniel. If it's the last thing we do on this show, yes, please honor some dudes. Who do we got? Isaiah Bugs, incredible, and was a fun figure on Alabama's ESPN show before the season started. Daniel Jones was everything once again for Duke. Everything, everything, everything. I said everything because I'm honoring Kadri Allison for pit run. Of Pitt's running game, uh, Dexter Williams for Notre Dame. Come on, full on dude. Drew Chrisman, the punter for Ohio State. DeAndre Swift, you know. Daryl Taylor for Tennessee. Tylen Wallace, my goodness. Madison Avenue for Boise State on the ground. David Long making plays all over the place for West Virginia. Bennett Skoranek for Northwestern with the incredible catch. Little Jordan Humphrey, the Rowenta iron of this show in college football. Jordan Love and Mo Ibrahim for Minnesota. All right, there you have it. Thank you to everyone who called in to our Reverb Line at 408 Verbal 1. Spirited as always. Big thanks to our boy Taylor who cuts those up, mashes them together, and puts <laughs> together this wondrous 
segment that we like to call the reverbs here. Uh, don't forget to follow us at solidverbal.com where you can find all of our old episodes and sign up for our newsletter, the newsletter of intent. We sent one out on Friday because we have shirts available. We've got shirts that are celebrating college towns across the good old U S of a. Yes. We've started with South bend, Eugene, Bethlehem and Easton. There will be more to come. We do have a survey at solidverbal.com slash survey where you can fill it in. Let us know what you want us to make next. We've gotten, Dozens upon dozens upon dozens of suggestions so far. So eventually, we promise we'll put more out there. And you're selling it short. We've gotten like 600. It's been a lot. Yeah. A lot. Also, feel free to follow us out there on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. We've been gramming the yeah. whole process of making a Sunday morning recap podcast. So check us out on Instagram if you haven't already. And if you'd like to continue the discussion, head on out to reddit.com slash r slash solid verbal it is our subreddit created by verballers for verballers dan that's all i got that's all i got on week 11 that's everything i have i'm about to run out and get some breakfast egg rolls for brunch ty because there's a place in brooklyn that does it i will report back you do that for that guy over there my good friend dan rubenstein for myself over here in eastern pennsylvania thanks again for listening catch you all on wednesday in the meantime Stay solid. Peace.